you. We thank the men's choir, amen, for that wonderful selection. This is what I need you to do. If you are watching, praise the Lord, I want you to hit the share button. I need you to hit a watch party, amen. We want to make sure that the word goes out to everyone, praise God. If you're watching, make sure you're sharing the page. Make sure you're having a watch party. We want to make sure that everyone gets the word that we're going to be preaching and sharing on today. Praise Lord. And see, when you do a watch party, somebody can come back later and watch the entire service on your page. And so we'd love to encourage you to, uh, amen, share the page. If you don't, also you can hit the in the share button, you can do a copy and you can copy it and then send that to email to somebody or send it by via text to somebody and they open that email and open that text and they can watch the service even if they don't have a Facebook account. Amen. So because our Facebook page is public, anyone can watch our broadcast if they have the link. Praise God. God bless you. Now, I want to direct your attention one more time to Genesis chapter 20. Amen. We've been, we've been preaching through the book of Genesis we completed, completed chapter 19 on last week. Amen. And so this week we'll pick up with our verses. If you didn't hear last week's lesson, make sure you get it. It was a little bit of a history lesson. It was called the Daughters of the Sodom Confederacy. So you want to check that out if you don't have that. Praise God. And I do appreciate uh, people sending me all sorts of links and information this week. Amen. About the Daughters of the Southern Confederacy. Amen. Not to be confused with the Daughters of the Sodom Confederacy, but a Amen. They did carry on an evil spirit. So that's what we taught on last week. But we're in Genesis chapter 20 today, and we're excited and glad that you're with us today. I don't know how long I'm appreciating. It may not be as long as it is in previous weeks because the message I think today will be a bit of a message that we've actually heard kind of before as we've been preaching through uh, the book of Genesis. We are now at chapter 20. And for uh, just a quick review, we read the entire chapter. But if you don't mind, I want to read uh, verses 10 and verse 11. Uh, and Abimelech asked Abraham, what was your reason for doing this? And Abraham replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. And Abimelech said, well, why would you do this to me? And Abraham's response was, I was scared. And I want to minister from the subject, when God fixes your mistake again. Amen. I want you to write that down in your lesson, uh, in your chat. Amen. Put it on your notes. Get your pen and your pad out. And the, the title for our subject this morning is, When God Fixes Your Mistake again. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your blessings. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your direction. Lord, right now, Lord, give us an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Speak, Holy Spirit, move through me and in me right now, Lord, so that I might have the words that are necessary and vital and significant for this moment. Speak now. Anoint me afresh. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for anything I I thought or did or said that wasn't pleasing your sight. Lord, right now, Lord, I want to be a vessel that can be used by you, Lord. For, Lord, I know that you use broken vessels, Lord, and I, 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 all I come to you, Lord, with cracks and all and, 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 and mistakes and all, and ask that you would use me, Lord, for your glory in this moment. Speak Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Uh, and so our subject this morning, first of all, we are glad that you're watching. Amen. Our subject this morning is when God fixes your mistake again. Uh, that's a long title. Normally my titles aren't that long. Uh, but my title says when God fixes your mistake and then on the end again. Praise the Lord. And so the first thing we've got to realize and understand is that we serve a good God. We serve a kind God. We serve a wonderful God. We serve a forgiving God. We serve a God of second chances. We serve a God that does not punish us the way we deserve. We serve a God that is more than merciful, more than kind, more than loving, more than wonderful. Amen. Even though God oftentimes, amen, has to discipline us, the good news is that God more than often blesses us over and over and over again. And if the truth be told, uh, uh, the blessing 
blessings that we receive are not because we were always obedient, not because we always dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. No, the blessings that we receive, as the scriptures say, every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. Yes, everything you have, everything you own, everything you possess, every experience that you had that you would count as a super duper blessing, understand that all of that came by the Lord. It was the Lord that woke you up in the morning. It was the Lord that started you on your way. It was the Lord that gave you a reasonable portion of health. It was the Lord that put food on your table. It was the Lord that made sure you had everything you needed. It was the Lord that gave you even some stuff you didn't need and stuck on top of your needs. Uh, everything we have is from the Lord. We serve a good God. We serve a kind God. We serve a God that loves us more than we will ever understand or ever know. And so we serve a good God. So it says when, when who? When God, the God that loves you and cares for you and will do anything for you. When God, amen, fixes, fixes. Oh, hallelujah. That means that something was broken. That means something was out of order. That means something wasn't operating the way it should have happened. When the good God, the kind God, the awesome God, the loving God, the merciful God steps in, amen, puts something back together, works something out, turns something around that you or and I may have messed up. When that God fixes it, when that God rescues us, when that God saves it, when that God turns it around, when God, amen, fixes your mistake, my mistake, hold on, what's a mistake? A mistake is something that I didn't plan on doing. If I, if I planned on doing it, I planned to do the wrong thing. Uh, when God comes in and does something, he fixes what you and I broke. When he fixes something, you and I screwed up, fixes something that you and I, you know, a uh, damage, fixes something that you and I did the wrong thing with. We didn't handle it correctly. We didn't go about it the way we should. We were out of order. We were lying or cheating or stealing, but God comes in, amen, and fixes it. That God comes in and turns it around as if it was never broken. That's, that's how God is. The God that we serve can fix something. Good God Almighty, as if we had done it right in the first place. Oh, I don't get enough shouts. Amen. I'm not getting enough amens like I should. You know, your God and my God can fix our stuff and my stuff so good. Amen. That at the end of the story, it looks like we never made a mistake in the first place. Hey, uh, now, when you look at Genesis chapter 20, amen, and you, you look at it, if you look at the end, amen, it, it, it's all blessings. It's all gravy. When you look at the end, uh, 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 Abimelech, uh, everything is going well. Uh, his, 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 his family, everybody is prospering. When you look at the end of uh, Genesis 20, uh, uh, Sarah is doing good. Abraham is blessed, amen, better than he was at the beginning of, of chapter 20, amen. If you just looked at the end, you would say, wow, that went well. If you looked at the end of chapter 20, you would have to say to yourself, wow, you know, that, that, that came out pretty good. Eh? All, all things work well, amen. They, things are going good. That, that's a good situation for Abraham. Abraham got some, some stuff from the king. Abraham's wife is doing well and, and the king's wives are doing well. All is blessed. The, the end of chapter 20 looks real good. The end of chapter 20 sounds real good. How many of y'all know the end don't always tell the whole story? Y'all, I wish I had some amens. Uh, sometimes the glory don't always tell the story. Sometimes how it looks at the end is not how it started. Because uh, uh, sometimes God will fix your stuff and fix it up so good good that when you look at it from the end it looks like wow everything must have fully went well for you and you look at the end result you would say to yourself wow Abraham made some good decisions uh, and Sarah made some good decisions uh, because of the way it looks at the end but I'm here to let you know your God can fix up your stuff and my stuff so good the end looks like it, we did everything right the end looks like we dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's uh, but can I help you amen you can never take the credit for how something worked out. You can never take the credit for your blessings because if truth be told, oftentimes God had to fix some stuff in the middle of that, had to turn some of that stuff around and make it look good. The end of chapter 20 looks good. The end of chapter 20, it, lo it looks great. Bob, that is not the whole story. If we only had the last couple of verses, uh, we would think, oh, this worked out pretty well. But uh, we got to look at the first couple of verses and really I understand that Abraham made a big mistake. 
Abraham made a huge blunder. Abraham made a serious error. Abraham uh, uh, did not follow through exactly like he should have. Abraham had some calculations in his thinking that were not correct. And he, he did some stuff that was wrong. He did some stuff that it was ungodly. He, he, he lied and he cheated. He, he, was, no, he was not a good example, amen, of what he should be as a person who knows God. He was not a good representative of what a person who knows God should be doing. Uh, and that helps us, amen, understand that nobody, even the person who considered one of the fathers of the faith, even somebody who considered as one of the giants of the faith, can, can every now and then uh, make a big mistake. The good news is God can fix our mistakes, amen, but that does not mean that we won't make mistakes, amen. Uh, Abraham is just like us, amen. Uh, we, don't, we don't see a lot of mistakes, but his life does have some mistakes at crucial moments uh, that, that we can learn from. And so let's take a pick. We see that God fixed it because we know the end of the story. We see that God worked it out because we know the end of the story. We see that God turned it around, flipped it back up the right side. But what, how did, what did God have to do and what did Abraham do wrong that required God to step in and do something supernatural and turn stuff around? Well, let's take a look at the text. Here we get to Genesis chapter 20. Amen. Prior to that, you go back a couple of chapters. Uh, uh, God, had, God has shown up himself and with angels to Abraham's house and told him, man, I'm going to bless you in a year's time, in 12 months time. Amen. That son that you've been waiting for will come. Uh, that promise that I made, amen, I'm going to manifest it and fulfill all the things that you've been waiting on. Abraham and Sarah had been waiting on that blessing. Abraham and Sarah had been waiting on and they did not have a timetable. Uh, matter of fact, they had waited so long, they had made some other mistakes in the process, amen, because they just assumed that God wasn't going to show up. And many of us make that same mistake. We don't think God is going to show up. But uh, in the previous chapters, God did show up and he told Abraham and his wife, Sarah, hey, you are going to have a child. And uh, matter of fact, it was at that moment, they had probably kind of thought, well, it ain't going to happen. We're not sure what God is doing but God says, nope, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. It may not be on your schedule. It may not be on your timetable but in 12 months time, uh, this old lady, amen, she's still fine but she's a little older. She is, she's past childbearing year but I'm going to bless her with a child. The Bible says that Sarah even laughed at the thought at that moment. She had to laugh to herself. She said, I don't I can't believe it. But God said, is there anything too hard for God? Ah, uh, which was a reminder that no matter what it looks like, if God said it, it shall be done. No matter how it feels, if God said it, it's going to come to pass. Uh, he said, in a year's time, 12 months time, you shall have a son. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. That was a wonderful declaration. Uh, Abraham and Sarah received it. Praise God. And then there's a story between that story and now. And uh, the Bible says that the angel, that, and they left Abraham and went down to Sodom and they judged Sodom in those, that, those next coming days. And between those next coming days, uh, uh, and with him now, we're probably within about uh, maybe 20, 30 days since Abraham and Sarah have heard that God is going to give them a child in a 12 months time, in a year's time. It's only been a couple of weeks, but the Bible says that Abraham Abraham moved from there into the region of the Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur for a while he stayed in Gerar and there Abraham said to his wife, said of his wife, matter of fact, he said of his wife to all the people around, she is my sister. Uh, then Abimelech king of Gerar sent for Sarah and took her. Well there's a couple of things you want to understand. God spoke to Abraham and God spoke to Sarah and said as I said before, in 12 months time, a year's time, you're going to have 
a son. Amen. Now all Abraham and Sarah had to do was stand on the last thing that God had said and just wait on the Lord. Amen. He said you're going to have a child. God didn't tell them to move. God didn't tell them to go anywhere. God didn't tell them to change address. God didn't tell them to pack their stuff up and move to another place. He just said in a year you're going to have a child. All they needed to do was just sit still for a year. All they had to do was just buy their time. All they had to do was wait on the Lord. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody here this morning. Uh, oftentimes, God will uh, give us and or tell us he's going to do something, and all we really have to do is wait. He didn't tell Abraham and Sarah in those previous chapters, you need to do this, you need to do that to, 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 make, to speed up the blessing. He said, in a year's time, so you need to be patient, and you need to wait on the Lord for a year. But what does Abraham and Sarah do? For some reason, it is not said in scripture, it's not alluded to, they decide that they ought to move. Now some scholars think because God had judged the cities of the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah was and that, that a lot of the fertile ground was not available and so it, it looked kind of tight from Abraham's perspective so he would take the idea to move his cattle to maybe more fertile landscape amen, that's what some people think but we, what we do know is that there is nowhere in scripture where God God directly tells Abraham uh, to pack your bags and move. Matter of fact, the last thing we really hear is God saying, you're going to have a baby, y'all, and so it's for 12 months. And I, have, let me help somebody today. Even when we look in this season, I was sharing this with somebody just on the other day. I said, all really God has told most of us to do right now is just wait. Amen. Just wait for things to be over. Just just wait. Amen. And if you go back, and I really want you to go back and watch my sermon from March 22nd called uh, Ride It Out. There's a part in that text where I remind the people that the Bible says it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but, a, but the waters didn't even start to recede until the 150th day, and, mo, and no one of them can't even get out the boat until like 300 some days. Amen. And it lets me know that Eight, and that Noah in the boat, his family, they were told about 40 days, and then the waters only recede to the 150th day. They had to wait on the boat. It was longer than what they expected, but all they had to do was wait. All they had to do was just sit still. All they had to do was chill out. All they had to do was relax. God had taken care of everything for them. They didn't need to do anything. They just needed to just wait on the Lord. And you know what I found out is that some of the most difficult things that people have to do is just learning how to wait. David said, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Waiting sometimes is some of the hardest thing we can do, especially when what we see around us makes us a little nervous or makes us kind of scary. Now, notice what it said. It, does, it never says there was any trouble where Abraham was. It never says in the text things were difficult where Abraham was, but for some reason he decided to pack his bags. Now, I'm telling you, I'm thinking that whatever reason he really left was, it really wasn't a good reason at all. But do you realize sometimes in our minds we can create problems that are bigger than they actually are? That we can create situations in our minds and make them bigger than they actually are and make decisions based on not what happened. Happen, but what we think might happen. Sometimes we make our decisions not based on what is really going on, but what how we have conceived the worst case scenario could happen. And here I believe Abraham couldn't stay still because he must assume that maybe this isn't a good place to be. Let me go somewhere else. And, and so the first mistake that he makes is that he can't wait long enough. God said in a year's time, God didn't tell him to move or go anywhere in a year's time you're going to have a child and this word is for someone today you just need to wait a little while longer you got I told you back in March we were going to be in this thing for a while I hope we wouldn't but go back and watch the message
message, ride it out. I told you, what do you do when we have to be in a storm or be in an isolated situation longer than what we expect? The first thing I said in that sermon is, is that we're going to need patience to adjust to our new normal. And here, look, he, God told Abraham and Sarah, 12 months time, oh, well, I don't, why y'all moving? Why are y'all packing stuff up? Where are you going? Ah, uh, uh, some of the hardest, one of the hardest things for us to do is just to wait. Amen. We, we are supposed to learn how to wait as children. We're supposed to master the waiting game by adulthood. But just by show of hands, man, in your house, how many of us have trouble just waiting on God? Uh, they, they have a difficulty waiting. And I believe that puts them in a bad position. Because when you can't wait, you make decisions that are not driven by the Lord. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I lost some of my broadcasts. I lost some of my viewers. Amen. I see some folks signing off because it's hitting too close to home. Amen. You, you couldn't wait on something. And because you couldn't wait on something, you found yourself somewhere where you shouldn't be. Oh, uh, you found yourself in a predicament that you shouldn't be in. You found yourself in a place that you didn't want. I'm telling you, we don't move too quick in this season. We are in right now. And that's why I don't understand why people, why governors, why presidents, why leaders. Uh, listen, understand, the United States government can print money. And I, and I, I understand, read that book called The Deficit Myth. We could be in a situation where everybody is okay. We don't have to rush anything. All we needed to do was to wait and be still, stay at home and chill out. But nah, nobody can do that. Nobody wants to do that. Everybody wants to be at the beach. I want to be at the beach, but we can't be at the beach right now. I want to be, I want to have this church full of people, but we can't do that right now. We've got to just wait for this thing to pass, but nobody wants to wait. They've got cases going up and in almost every state, amen, and even in Virginia, stuff was going down. Our stuff now is going back up. We love, folk, we just need to be still and wait and let this thing pass, but people don't want to wait, and when you don't want to wait, you will find yourself in a worse situation than what you left. The Bible says there was really nothing going on where Abraham was, but he didn't. When it gets to Gerar, the text says that he told his wife, Sarah, he said, listen here, a, if they ask who you are, let them know you're my sister. Now, technically, she was kind of his sister. Amen. Not, not, not directly sister, but they shared some, they were related, but it wasn't the truth. It was kind of a half truth. Amen. They're trying to, they're, they're telling stories. So he couldn't wait. And because he couldn't wait, he was afraid that when he got to Gerar, the people in Gerar, instead of receiving him and respecting him, uh, uh, Abraham assumed that he had to, that he had to lie so that nobody would kill him, amen, cousin's wife. You're saying, hold on, pastor, I've heard this story before. Yes, you have. 25 plus years before in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham found himself in a similar situation. Now that time we know he left because there was a famine. He shouldn't have left because God can give you favor in a famine. And can I help you? You're supposed to learn that God can give you favor in a famine. So when you're in a situation that isn't even a famine, God can can still give you favor. Okay, y'all missed that. That went over some of y'all. If God could give you favor in a famine, amen, and there's no need to move, you can trust God in your famine situation. When you get in a situation that isn't even famine level, how are you not going to trust God now? Hold on now. If God can handle you in a bad situation that was worse than what you dealt with in Genesis 12, why would you not trust him now when the situation isn't even as dire? So Abraham makes the same mistake again. Oh, that's the sermon right there. Hold on. He In Genesis 12, he made the mistake with Pharaoh. Now in Genesis 20, he's going to make the same mistake again. Oh, but pastor, what is the good news? Well, in Genesis 12, God 
fix Abraham's mistake one time in Genesis 20. God's going to fix his mistake again. Oh, you ought to get some shout in you right now because let's be honest. God has sometimes had to fix us with the, on the same mistake more than once. You didn't just make that mistake twice. You uh, Once you made that mistake twice. You made that mistake three times. But guess what? God in his grace, God in his mercy, God in his kindness came in even though you made the same mistake again and he fixed it. Even though you did it again, he worked it out. Even though you did it again, he turned it around. Now is there a license for you to go do something stupid and do something you know isn't a smart thing or make the same mistake again? No. It is a commentary on how good God is. Uh, Genesis 20 is not a reminder for you and I to go out and do something dumb. It is a reminder that we serve a God who loves us better than we love ourselves. He serves a God that will protect us even when we don't think he can protect us. We serve a God that will provide even when we deserve for all our stuff to be taken away. The Bible says that Abraham goes to Gerar. He shouldn't have gone there. He didn't wait on God. He should have stayed where he was. God didn't tell him to do nothing, but he moves. He gets to Gerar, and he gets scared. Amen. He starts to worry. So the first point is not waiting long enough, and the second point is worrying too much. These are crucial mistakes. Some of our mistakes are tied under the umbrella or fall under the umbrella that we couldn't wait long enough, and some of our mistakes are caught up under the umbrella that we were worrying too much. Oh, y'all missed that. I need you to write down. He couldn't wait long enough, and he, they, he was worrying too much. Uh, there was no reason for him to worry that he had conjured up in his mind that these people uh, uh, were going to brutalize him. He had conjured up in his mind uh, a story, a false narrative of these people. He had prejudged them. He had decided that they were ungodly. He, he had decided that they didn't know God. He decided they didn't respect people. He had decided that they, I don't know what he heard about them, but he didn't know them and you know it's a dangerous thing for you to believe something about somebody without any real evidence uh, it's a dangerous thing to prejudge somebody based on something in your mind and not based on real experiences or real truth and facts uh, Abraham is prejudging these people Abraham assumes that he only he knows God and these folk must not know God and he is worrying about something that isn't even true and often times the things that we worried about aren't even really things to worry about but we have talked ourselves into it and have convinced ourselves uh, that it is really something to lose our minds about and some of us right now are losing sleep about stuff and you ain't got no real reason to worry about it. I had to laugh amen before the pandemic I had to, uh, I, my, my bank account was looking kind of funny. Amen. There were during the pandemic my bank account looking better than it ever did and I'm freaking out and tripping out and then I'm losing my mind what am I going to do for this and what am I going to do for that and God has blessed me and taken care of all of my stuff in my situation and I was worrying about stuff didn't really have no real reason to worry about it I'm lose God said I done, I done got you through all this other stuff why are you losing your mind and some of us are worrying too much when the reality is God has been more than faithful and he has shown us that he will take good care of us and so why are we worrying so the first point is uh, one a big mistake that that you can make is not to wait long enough. A second big mistake you can make is to worry too much and worry too much about something you don't even really have good evidence. You ought to be worrying that much about it. The Bible says it. He said when they get there he tells Sarah, hey tell them you are my sister. Now you got to understand this ancient culture. This is not 20th century culture. This is ancient, 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 ancient culture. One of the things in the ancient, ancient culture was if a man had a quote unquote sister and she wasn't married one of his responsibilities was to find her a good suitor, a good person to marry. So when Abraham shows up and has folk telling his sister, well automatically that means that he is looking for a suitor. And so in you would always look for the best suitor. The, and so if the wealthiest person was looking for a wife, they would be considered the best suitor for a 
your quote unquote sister. And so when Abraham shows her the town, telling him, that's my sister, she's saying, that's my brother. Everybody assumes that she is looking for a husband and he is looking for a suitable husband for her. And so without getting into details, the ancients who, were, who heard this story would clearly understand what was happening that, wow, you're going to want to marry the top dude in town. Amen. Abimelech. So Abimelech steps up. She's available. Wow. I'll take her to be a, one of my wives. Amen. That was common. We wouldn't probably do that now. That's not something that we think about. But that was common in ancient cultures. And nobody batted an eye about it. Matter of fact, by doing that, Abraham now would find himself in good graces with not only the leader in the town, but everybody else wouldn't bother Abraham because of his now connection with this man. If this was just his sister, this would have been all right. If this was just his sister, this would not have been a problem. But she wasn't just his sister. She was his wife. And that is a little different. That's a big issue. And one of the things that I see is that Abraham him, and I shared this with you before, he compromises a little too much with regards to this. He's trying to play both sides. He's trying to figure out a way to say something without him being totally honest, without giving all of the facts. And this is, is showing a serious character flaw in Abraham. Abraham, this is the second time Abraham is operating in fear. And I'm not talking about holy fear like Noah had, but a, a fleshly fear. Uh, he is operating under a, a fear that God can't protect him and God won't watch over him. Hold on now. We, when we can't wait long enough is because we think God won't, won't do it. Uh, we, don't, we don't think God is going to do it. And we were, when we're worrying too much, we're doing the same thing. We don't think, we think that God can't do something. Amen. And here in this text, Abraham is assuming God can't provide for him supernatural protection against anybody. If God has told you in 12 months time you're going to have a son, you should assume nothing's going to happen in that 12 months that's going to stop you from what was going to come to pass. And so why would you think it's okay to put your sister or your wife, excuse me, in a position where somebody else is going to want to marry her and when you know that God has already told you what the future holds for you. God has already laid it out for you. Why are you worrying? We're worrying and Abraham worries because we forget to trust God, because we fail to trust God. If if the if the answer for not being able to wait is having more patience, the answer for worrying is trusting God more. Ah, uh, the Bible says, trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding. I think they had Abraham in mind when they said that. Trust in the Lord, not yourself, and lean not to your own understanding. And in all all your ways acknowledge him the bible says god will direct your path god will direct your path what is abraham doing in this moment he is directing himself for look when when because some bad happened Abimelech goes to Abraham and he says, why would you do that? Why would you lie? I was about to take her as a wife, but the Bible says God showed up <coughs> to Abimelech at night and told him, <coughs> excuse me, told him, I'm preaching too hard, told him that, hey, that's, that's, that woman is married. Judgment is about to fall on your house if you follow through with marrying this woman. And Abimelech, amen, fearing God more than Abraham's fearing God. Abimelech wakes up that next morning, gets his officials and tells them what happened. The reason stuff's been acting kind of funny around here is because homegirl over there ain't really his sister. She's really his wife. I'm about to straighten him out. I'm about to read him. I'm getting Abraham in here and I'm about to let him have it. Amen. He has put all of us in danger. Amen. About by, 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 by putting us in this situation where we were about to do something we had no business doing. I'm about to marry her thinking she is available to be married when she's already married to that guy. Bring him here. And so they bring Abraham to Abimelech and because God had told Abimelech, Abimelech, now this is what happened. But now you can't, you can't, Abraham is going to be the only one that Abraham's going to have to pray for you. Amen. And he's a prophet and he's going to pray for you and you're going to be all right. So God kind of told Abimelech, well, you can't kill him because if you kill him, 
You're not your, your stuff's gonna get jacked up. So you going no. When he comes in there, you can ask you know you ask him the questions, but you got one of the things you need to do is ask him. He gonna have to pray for you. So but Abimelech has Abraham come in. Abraham comes in, and Abimelech says, "Go, well look at man. I first you know well, why did you do what you did? Why why did you do what you did? That, that, I mean that was crazy. Nobody threatened you. Nobody was trying to hurt you." You know, why would you think we're like this? Why do you think you're the only civilized person around? Why do you think you're the only person that fears God? Why, why would you think that? that? That doesn't make any sense. And, and Abraham replied, he said, I said to myself. That's what it says in the text. In verse 11, Abraham replied, I said to myself, how, let's be honest, how many times have we gotten in trouble because of st instead of listening to God, we said to ourselves, I said to myself, maybe I should do that. No. What did God tell you to do? What, 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 what direction was God giving you? Remember, trust in the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him and, and, God, and, and God will direct you in all your ways. Right now, what's going on with Abraham? Abraham is directing his own self as opposed to God directing him. Abraham clearly says, I said to myself. There is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. That's the same mistake he made before. The, pre, the Pharaoh in chapter 12, as soon as God told him something, he quickly changed everything and fixed everything. Abraham now is making the same mistake with Abimelech. And we guess what? Later on, Abraham's son Isaac will make another mistake just like that. And, and can I give you a heads up? If you make these mistakes, oftentimes you put in that same kind of fear and worry and, and inability to wait in your children. And later on, they'll make the same kind of mistakes because they see it in your life. But it, it's, that's, not the, that's not the sermon, but let me get back to it. So the Bible says, he says, I said to myself, mm. those are famous last words. How many times have you and I got ourselves into some stuff because we would listen to us instead of the Lord? Abraham curated his whole narrative about these people that they were going to, they were terrorists and they were terrible and they were uh, this, this, this. When, when in reality, they feared God more than Abraham did. And so the Bible says that Abraham was worrying about, look, he couldn't wait long enough and he was worrying too much. And so what happens is this, the last thing I want you to see here about this is that because they're all W's, couldn't wait long enough, worried too much. And he was too weak to really be strong. What do I mean by that? Abraham is, 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 is he's like us. He's, he's weak in his flesh. When he gets confronted with stuff, instead of being strong in God, instead of being strong in the Lord, instead of finding strength in God, he looks to his flesh, which is weak, and his flesh cannot support what he's dealing with. And so instead of being strong, he's weak. And beloved, what we need right now is not for us to get weak in our faith. What we need now is for us to get stronger in our faith. This situation that we are in in our country especially is designed to make us stronger in our faith. But what it is doing is exposing that oftentimes we are very weak in our faith. I know I'm not getting the amens now. But what's supposed to happen is we're supposed to be able to wait on God, not worry, and not be weak. We're supposed to be strong. We're supposed to be patient. And we're supposed to be able to trust. Let me say it again. God doesn't want us, he, God, God doesn't want us where we can't wait or where we're worrying too much, or where we're weak. God wants us strong. God wants us to trust him. And God wants us to be patient. This, these were the mistakes that Abraham made a second time. Now the good news is God fixed it. God turned it around. God fixed everything. The Bible says that after that, Abimelech brought him some sheep and everything, and then everything was back to normal at Abimelech's house and Abimelech's family and Abimelech in town. Everything was back. God fixed it. God turned everything around. But the mistakes they made, they couldn't be patient. They couldn't trust, and they were too weak. They, couldn't, they were worrying too much. They couldn't wait. God wants us to be patient. 
God wants us to trust him. And God wants us to be strong and not weak. What does that mean, be strong and weak? That means when I'm tempted to crumble, I have to draw on God and say, God, give me strength. When I'm tempted to fall under the pressure and do something I know I shouldn't do, I've got to ask God, Lord, remind me that I can be strong in you. Remind me I don't have to worry about anything. Give me strength to wait. There's a reason why David says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. There is a connection between being strong in God and being able to wait on God. They're connected. If you can't wait on God, you're not going to be strong. You can't be strong if you can't wait on God. And part of that thing that holds it all together is your ability to not worry. Jesus says, do not worry in Matthew 6 and Luke 6. He reminds us that, if, and this came up on my Facebook timeline this week. If God will watch over the little sparrow, surely he's going to watch over you. And when it comes down to it, even in this country, the big one of the biggest issues that's jamming us up right now, we're worrying about it, not understanding and not believing that God can take care of us. Even if we've got to stay in, even if we have to limit what we do, even if we're not able to get out, that God will still provide and take good care of us. We cannot keep making the same mistake again and not trusting, not being patient, and not being strong. God, because even though God's going to fix it again, he's given us a second chance to get it right. Amen. And God will share with you in the morning. You back in March, March 22nd, we preached that sermon, ride it out. We said, oh, wow, the waters didn't even start to recede until the 150th day. It is only day 119, 120 right now for us. And so the, Noah had to wait 150 days before the water started to even recede. So we haven't even got to the 150th day yet. We're still like 120. We still got 30 days to go just to, before the waters to recede. So beloved, let's be patient. Let's trust God. Let, let's not be like Abram. who All he had to do was just wait. All he had to do was just sit still. God did not say, Abraham, you had to jump through a bunch of hoops. You got to do this and do that. All he said was, wait. Can you wait on God? Let's not make the same mistake again. The good news, God can fix it. But let's now, let's learn from our mistakes. Hallelujah. God has, God has kept us. Amen. So let us not, let us not become impatient. Let us not become, uh, uh, not, not, don't let us worry. And we don't want to get into this thing where we start crumbling in our faith. Amen. Yes, I know none of us expected to be here this long. I know none of us expected for this situation to go this long. Well, that's how it is. That's what we are. And nothing we can do about it. But what we can do is trust God. What we can do is wait on God. What we can do is, 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 is be strong in the Lord. Amen. Because God, now, we don't want God, you know, God has been good to us. And, some, and look, let's be honest. Some of us haven't waited. And some of us have been worrying. And some of us have been weak in our faith. But the good news is God is going to fix it. He's given us another chance. Amen. To trust him more. To depend on him more. And to believe that God is going to carry us through this situation. All we got to do is wait. Abraham didn't wait. Then he jammed himself up. Let's not do the same thing that Abraham did. Let's wait. Let's be strong. Let's, tr let's trust God. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for all that you have said and all that you have done for us today. Lord, I'm praying that there's someone under the sound of my voice who needs to hear you and needs a word and needs to know that they're loved, needs to know that they can care for, needs to know that God will give them a second chance. Speak to their hearts. Show them, Lord, your love and your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're watching, our number is 804 two three two five one two four let us know either by calling us or sending our message to us that you may want to give your life to christ the good news is you don't have to be in a building to get saved praise god we see that now you don't even have to get baptized to get saved right where you are you can ask the lord jesus to come into your life and save your soul right there 
praise God. You can get saved in your living room. You can get saved in your kitchen. You can get saved in your car. Right where you are, ask the Lord Jesus to come in your life and save your soul, and you'll be saved just like that. Amen. Your next order of business is to get connected to some other believers. Amen. Whether that's a good church in your community, whether that's us at Second Baptist, we would love to be your church home, especially if you are in the Richmond metropolitan area. We would love to be your church home. And if you want to be part of our church, all you got to do is call us, send us a message. We will talk to you about your relationship with God. We will tell you about our online classes, how you can grow in God and learn more about your new relationship with God. If you already know the Lord and you, and you want to join our fellowship, just call send us a message we will gladly love to have you and tell you about our new members classes amen that you can join and, and attend online virtually praise god we do our new members class every first and third uh sundays and so if you join this week we have class for you next sunday amen morning for you to begin to learn about us and about your relationship with god praise the lord well once again we are thankful 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 that you tuned in thankful thankful thing that you allowed us amen to bring church amen into your house amen church into your living room now the lord put something in my spirit before I got here. I saw it and then it dropped in my mind. Lord said, echo that. I saw it somewhere and then Lord said, echo that to the people. Is that what God has been doing a bunch of things in this time pandemic. But what he wants to you to do and me to do is to make sure we don't come to church but church is where we are. Amen. That church is in your house. That you're praising God. Worshiping God. Studying the word, reading the word, fellowshipping in your home. Amen. Your home should be a sanctuary for the Lord. Where God's word is taught. Where you study and learn. Think on Wednesday night, you're at home. You're, you, if you're with me, you're, you're studying the word. God said, I want you studying your word at home regularly. We have worship service in, in your home right now. God says, I, even after this is over. There are going to be some days where you need to have a worship service in your house on a Saturday, on a Friday, where you're getting the word open, you're reading, you're praying, and you're talking to God, and you're, you're hearing from the word of the Lord. Amen. Because God wants us to not just come to church, but he wants us to be the church. He's challenging us right now to be the church. What does that mean? If you know someone in need, bless them. If you know someone needs prayer, pray for them. If you know your neighbor is in trouble, help them out. Amen. So we're going to be the church, not just come to a church. But God is saying, now I want you to be the church in your family. So that means some of you all need to share this message or share previous messages or share stuff you learned in Bible study and share them with friends and family. Amen. So that we can be the church wherever we are. The church just in that 3300 Broad Rock Boulevard is wherever you are. Amen. Now, God bless you. Now, remember, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So this week, I don't want you all out in the street too much, but make a quick run into the grocery store, get you some grape juice and some bread. Amen. And we're going to have communion together virtually on next Sunday. Praise God. Don't forget Tuesday's Bedtime Bible Stories with Lady K and Praise the Penguin. And we got another surprise coming for you with regards to that. Hopefully we'll get that this week. Then Wednesday, we're going to continue our study in Deuteronomy. Amen. On Wednesday Bible study at 6.30. And then Thursday, we've been praying. The scriptures say, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So we are praying every Thursday morning at 7 a.m. on a prayer call. We would love for you to be on that call. That information is on our website as well as our Facebook page. The prayer call. You call the number and there's a code you put in. Right at 7, we start praying all the way to 7.30. Amen. We would love for you to be on that. Now, God bless you. Have a good week. Be safe. Listen, y'all. We are still in a pandemic. There's still stuff going on. That means act accordingly. Do the hygiene, which we normally do, but make sure you are doing your sanitizing. Make sure that you're wearing your mask. Make sure that you're limiting your activities. Amen. I know we want to get out there, but we no, no. We just, all, all the Lord wants us to do is just wait a little while longer. Just wait a little while longer. That's all we got to do. Trust God. Amen. Don't, make it, don't, don't go out there doing that stuff you don't need to be doing. Just wait a little bit. The beach will be there. It'll be there next summer. It, it, you ain't got to run out and do crazy stuff. Wait on God. 
Let me pray for you. God, now bless and keep us. Watch over and protect us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. God bless you. God bless you. See you Tuesday. See you Wednesday. And let's pray together on Thursday. God bless you. Have a great one. Here we go. Happy birthday, OC. Hey, OC is turning 67. Amen. Happy birthday. One more birthday is coming up. Now, Lady Cassandra Hodge drive by that's on my facebook page the information it's going to be july the 25th we would love for everybody to come by our house we were going to just have a big party but we can't do that but we can do a drive by all you need to do is drive by wish you a happy birthday we would love to see you our information is on the uh it's an eventbrite so you go to my page and you see the eventbrite link and you can you get information it, it says you said get a ticket but all the tickets are free there's no ticket but the ticket gives you the, like the address so where you come to so july 25th from 6 to 8 we live in verona so if you want to make that drive come on out and just come by and wave and say happy birthday we would love to see you she's going to be 50 years old we have planned a big party but we're going to have the entire church come to our house we got we got a lot of land 